Hello Year 6, this is Chapter 14 and I wonder if we'll find out any more about the messages between Laura and an unknown stranger. Let's find out. Every time Laura thought about the pebble and driftwood why she'd left in the sand, she started giggling. Mr Gilbert told her off twice for being disruptive and Kevin Routledge suggested she consider seeing a psychiatrist, only he didn't put it quite so nicely. Laura paid no attention to either of them. The fact that the second message had been written in the sand convinced her that the whole thing was a game being played by a kid or a group of kids. As long as she took care not to be seen by any of them and didn't reveal her name, she didn't see any harm in going along with it. It might be fun. Sort of like having an invisible friend. She was smiling as she tripped along the cobblestone harbour late that afternoon. As part of Mr Gilbert's programme of introducing the children to potential careers, a trio of classical musicians had come to the school. Their beautiful music had reduced even Kevin Routledge to open-mouthed admiration. The grin left Laura's face as she drew nearer to the lonely section of the path where she'd left the bottle. Suddenly, it seemed the most important thing in the world that there was a message waiting for her. She didn't know if she could bear it if there wasn't. The grass on the northern slope of the island grew in clumps that reminded Laura of the tussocks that concealed fairies in picture books. Many had little hollows beneath them. It was into one of these that Laura had tucked the bottle, reasoning that her pen friend would understand if she left it in its original position on the path. It might have been thrown away by a litter collector or read by a third party. She would placed it in a partial view near the path, where it would be seen by anyone searching for it, but was unlikely to be spotted by anyone who wasn't. The bottle in the hollow was where she had left it. The cream parchment had been exchanged for a piece of paper torn from a school exercise book and the ink swapped for a black biro. Only the handwriting was the same. Why? she'd written on the beach. It had been a cheeky reply because she didn't see why she should have to prove herself to a total stranger. She unrolled the paper and spread it out on the path. Because if I trust the wrong person, I could die. She dropped the paper and stepped back from it. A gust of wind caught it and blew it onto the rocks. Seconds before it was washed into the sea, she snatched it up again. She looked up at St Nicholas's Chapel, hoping to see a giggling prankster or group of pranksters, perhaps Kevin Routledge and his moronic friends, falling about because she'd been gullible enough to reply to their messages. But no one was there. A chill went through Laura that had nothing to do with the March wind. She'd been 99% sure that the notes in the bottle were a game. Now she was about 97% sure they weren't. She straightened out the paper. Because if I trust the wrong person, I could die. She could return the note to the bottle, leave it on the path and hope that someone else would find it. That way it would be their problem, not hers. But walking away from the message, writer, but walking away from someone in trouble was not in Laura's nature. If the message writer died because she'd turned her back on a cry for help, she didn't want it on her conscience. For several long minutes, she agonised over the right thing to do. At last, she took a pen from her school bag and wrote at the bottom of the paper, Tell me what to do. Over the course of the day, Laura came up with dozens of different theories on why the message writer was in mortal danger. She wondered why he or she didn't go to the police, a lawyer or even a doctor. 
Weren't those sorts of people supposed to be trustworthy? The fact that the note writer hadn't, cocked, had, hadn't contacted the authorities suggested that they were scared or had done something illegal. They had to be pretty desperate to put their faith in a random passing stranger, a stranger who might just turn out to be an 11-year-old girl. Walking home from school, Laura kicked a rock savagely. If she had a friend, life would be so much easier. If Tariq hadn't turned into a freak, she could have taken the notes to him and in his sensitive, thoughtful way, he'd have known what to do. Just like he'd known what to do when the dogs were at each other's throats. He was smart. More than that, he was intuitive. He had always known when she'd had a terrible day at school, long before she told him. He'd present her with a bar of chocolate, or a fresh peach, or some other treat, when she had a feeling that the Mukta's didn't know about. But that, however, was the old Tariq. The new Tariq would simply laugh at her. He'd joke with Mr Mukta that she'd been reading too many Matt Walker books. Actually, Laura wished she'd read even more. Matt Walker would have seen through the puzzle in an instance. He would have identified the calligraphy as being unique to a particular region of the world and would have known off the top of his head what the paper used was, say, made by a special printing press found only in the Outer Hebrides. Laura could only see that a cheap biro had been used on one note and a quill and ink on the other. She had no t plans to tell her uncle about the messages either. Oh, he'd listen to her carefully and be very nice about them. He might even tell her that he'd have a chat with the police next time he was passing the station. Then he'd go into his office and forget she'd ever mentioned it. No, apart from her pen friend, she was on her own. Again. Laura was hurrying along Ocean View Terrace with her head down, hoping not to run into Mrs Crabtree or the bird watcher, when something shiny caught her eye. A fragment of silk tapestry was lying in the gutter. It was about three inches square and damp from the morning's rain. On it was the face of a tiger, exquisitely crafted. A tear was rolling down the tiger's cheek. Laura's heart began to thud. She knew precisely where she'd last seen such a tiger on a tapestry behind the counter on the North Star. She picked it up and looked up and down the street. There was no one in sight. She found herself hoping with every fibre of her being that Tariq had left it for her as a sign, as an apology or a plea for understanding. But if he had, surely he'd have put it through her letterbox in an envelope or at least left it on her doorstep, weighed down with a rock. As it was, there was no telling how long the tiger had lain undiscovered in the gutter. Mrs Crabtree. She always knew everything. If Tariq had been within a hundred metres of the Ocean View Terrace, Mrs Crabtree would have spotted him from her window. Laura bounded up her neighbour's path and knocked on the door. There was no answer. Typical. The one time Mrs Crabtree's spying might have come in useful, she'd gone out. Much to Laura's surprise, her uncle was in the kitchen when she got home. He was putting the roast Mrs Webb had prepared into the oven. Half day, he explained with a weary grin. He was unshaven and there were deep grooves of tiredness around his eyes. Laura sat down at the table and he made her a hot chocolate. He brewed himself an extra strong coffee and joined her. I stopped, path, past, I stopped by the North Star today as I said I would. It's probably not what you want to hear, but Tariq seemed to be doing very well. 
I didn't talk to him because he was rushing in and out unpacking boxes. But I had a good view at him and there were no bruises on him. No visible ones anyway. He certainly wasn't limping or showing any other signs of injury or distress. Mr Mukhtar was behind the counter and was praising his son to the skies. Laura couldn't hide her irritation. Mr Mukhtar and his wife are phonies. They always do that. I can't understand why everyone is so taken in by them. And Tariq is not their son. He's adopted. Calvin Redfern took a sip of black coffee. They're popular because they help out in the community, run a good store and they're pleasant to everyone who goes in it. Mrs Crabtree says she doesn't trust the Mukhtars because Tariq is a reflection of what's going on behind closed doors. She calls him a poor, sad boy. Her uncle grimaced. I hardly think Mrs Crabtree is in a position to judge, not with the amount of time she spends poking her nose into other people's affairs. The Tariq I glimpsed was neither poor nor sad. He was very thin and yawning a lot, but apart from that, he appeared to be content and well taken care of. That's good, said Laura. I'm glad he's happy. I'm still mad at him, but I want him to be OK. Changing into her pyjamas later that night, he, she studied the tiny tapestry again. It was ridiculous to think that Tariq had left it on her doorstep as an apology. Lots of people had bought tapestries from Mr Mukhtar. Any one of them might have dropped the miniature tiger as they strolled along Ocean View Terrace. Tariq sounded far too busy to give a moment's thought to her boring to his boring ex-friend. Still, it was hard to let go of the idea. She found the tiger comforting. She put it on the bedside table beside the picture of her mother. Then she switched off the light and lay for a long time listening to the ceaseless rolling of the waves. It was at times like this that she wondered if she had it in her to be a detective. Mysteries were piling up and she could no, see no way of solving any of them. The whole situation was like St Ives itself, full of blind alleys. Frustrated, Laura asked herself the same question she always did, when she found herself with more questions than answers. What would Matt Walker do?